Get through it.
Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day at College Hill Presbyterian Church. Uh, thank you for being here. I know summer uh, is a good time to play hooky, uh, but you all are here, so even the pastor is playing hooky. So uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here. I have a few announcements to highlight. Uh, first, in your bulletin, just have a look. But one thing I did want to tell you is that Pizza in the Park is scheduled, but it's going to be canceled because, uh, quote, it's too hot. So uh, no Pizza in the Park. Uh, the other one is if you are a VBS volunteer, your t-shirts are available for pickup in the education office around the way. Uh, and the last announcement I had is while there will be jam and elementary roots today, older kids' roots is not being held today. Um, all right, with that, uh, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I invite you to stand. Please join me in the responsive call to reading. You can find it in the bulletin. Let me hear what the Lord God will speak. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear God. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Come, let us worship God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the splendor of creation and in the beauty of human life. Touched by your hand, our world is holy. Help us to cherish the gifts that surround us, to share our blessings with our sisters and brothers, and to experience the joy of life in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. So in faith and in penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Holy One, hear us and help us to speak the truth about ourselves. We have wandered from your path. We have turned from people in pain. We have ignored your love for us. We are truly sorry, and we want to return to your ways. Forgive us, free us, and make us new. Hear us now as we pray in the silence of our hearts. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives you all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share signs of peace. Since Pastor Matt is not here, there is not a children's time, but children are free to go to jam and to elementary roots now, if you like. First scripture reading is from the book of Amos, chapters 1 through 12. This is what the Lord God showed me, a basket of fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, says the Lord God. The dead bodies shall be many cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the epa small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of these deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who lives in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. And I will turn your feast into mornings and all your songs into lamentation. 
I will bring sackcloth on all loins and the baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for only sun and the end of it like bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. So my name is Brett Hendrickson. I'm filling in the pulpit this morning, if you haven't noticed yet. Uh, I've met, I think, probably everybody, but just in case, um, I'm a professor of religious studies at Lafayette College, just over there. Um, and, um, you know, family goes to this church. Uh, but before I became a professor, I served churches as a Presbyterian minister. Um, so I have some reason to be here, but I'm rusty, very rusty. And uh, so I plead your forbearance. Uh, I think there are really three things about filling in the pulpit. Uh, the one, you got to be faithful. That goes without saying. Sh try to be brief. And, uh, and I think you should always leave it where people are happy that the other pastor's coming back. So <laughs> and I think I, I should be able to do all those things, so I hope. So um, our scripture text, the second one here is from Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in God's sight, who is our rock and our redeemer. Since I last did this, I used to have to like deal with all the papers up here, and now you have to deal with the papers and the computer. And so it's just I, one more, you know, it's just a little trickier. So every once in a while in life, you gotta ask yourself some big questions. Big, big questions. So I have a few of those questions that I just wanted to start with to kind of get us rolling here. For example, what would the speed of lightning be if it didn't zigzag? Whatever happened to preparations A through G? You ever wonder that? It's a big question. Here's another one. What was, what was the best thing before sliced bread? So, I mean, it, it seems not that big a deal, but what was the best thing before that? Another bit question, have you ever imagined a world with no hypothetical situations? Why is the Department of the Interior responsible for the outdoors? Why does your nose smell, but your, 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 your nose run, but your feet smell? It, it just doesn't make any sense. And, and finally, I think the biggest question of all, what's the difference between normal ketchup and fancy ketchup? <laughs> Who can say? But seriously, getting to an, an honest-to-goodness big question that I want us to grapple with today in, 
in this sermon. Why are you a Christian? Why do you come here week after week, even in the middle of summer when the pastor's on vacation? I mean, do you believe in all this stuff about Jesus being God and dying and rising from the dead? So what does it mean for you when you say, yes, I am a Christian? That's the big question. Why are you a Christian? And if you say that, if you say, yes, I'm a Christian, what does that mean about you? Does something essential change about you as a person if you're a Christian? I ask those questions because I've been meditating on this passage from Colossians that I read to you this morning. And it's in the context of that stunning and theologically dense passage that I ask these questions. That passage, it's a description that theologians say is a description of the cosmic Christ. The cosmic Christ. And in this cosmic Christ that Paul writes about in Colossians, Paul says we see the invisible God. This is one of the strongest and most complete affirmations of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in all of Scripture, these verses. If Christ is Lord, we must ask ourselves, is Christ our Lord? And if, when I say that I am a Christian, am I merely referring to some civic or social association that I have, or am I confessing with Paul and all the saints that yes, Christ is my Lord and I have no other? Now these are tricky questions, not as tricky as the ones I started the sermon with, but these are tricky questions because while they probably have something to do with how you live your day-to-day -day public life, they also have a whole lot to do with how we orient our inner life. They have to do with our emotions and our interior experiences. In this interior life, Christians have got a tradition to consider that. It's called mysticism or con contemplation or contemplative mysticism, if you want to put it all together. And, and mystics, and, and as I, I can say this as a religion professor, mysticism is kind of this worldwide tradition that takes place in almost every religion around the world. There'll be a subgroup of, of believers who are mystical, who are contemplative, who are looking inside. And, and they all have remarkably similar priorities, these, these contemplatives. And, Christian contemplatives, at least, were not unusual in this regard. What they seek is a true experience of the holy. They really want to experience the holy. They want to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with God, with the divine. Kind of an unmediated experience. And they want to have, and they seek out, what, what all of us have probably had small glimpses of, and it's that experience of knowing, truly knowing, that you exist in God's presence. And that's an experience that fills your life with meaning, and it simultaneously makes you feel very small. It's paradoxical mysticism. Now this mystical knowledge of God has not always, but has often been neglected by mainline Protestant denominations like Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutherans, UCC. Instead, we mainline Protestants have books and programs and ethics and mission. We have polity and arguments and confessional statements. We have learned sermons, but we don't always focus on that emotional connection with the risen Christ that each of us as Christians should be able to enjoy. It reminds me a little bit of the story of Mary and Martha in the Gospels. You probably remember this story. Martha, Jesus goes to visit his friends Mary and Martha, and Martha's running all around the kitchen getting stuff together, and Mary's sitting there listening to Jesus. Martha is the non-contemplative. She's a doer. She's active. She loves Christ and doesn't just moon around staring at him like her dreamy sister, Mary. Then Jesus says that Mary has chosen the better way, the contemplative, the mystical. And it's hard for us at least to get what Jesus could be talking about 
because we Presbyterians tend to think that it is better to do than to feel any day of the week. But Paul, in his description of our Lord Christ in the letter to the Colossians, invites us to meditate not on doing and acting, but invites us to meditate on Jesus, the man, the God, who holds all things together. So I think we should follow Paul's lead. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to describe and discuss some of the things Paul wrote about Jesus Christ. And I invite you not only to listen, but to contemplate these things. Hold them in your heart, ponder them, feel them if you can. So Paul says, Christ is the firstborn of all creation firstborn of all creation, and that he was before all things, and all things were created in him. Now, I find this hard to imagine. Before there was anything, when there was only nothing, there was Christ, Jesus Christ. Christ is present before even the very first words of God were spoken. And the Gospel of John reinforces this when it reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Firstborn of all creation. Now another thing Paul says in Colossians is that not only is Christ the firstborn of all creation, but Christ is also firstborn of the dead. Firstborn of the dead, of all life forms, who live and die, Christ is the firstborn of the dead. What does this mean? Well, maybe it gives us hope that life is in God's hands, that even when creation is hurt, when it dies, it is redeemed and saved by Jesus, who as the firstborn of the dead was born again from the tomb to a new life for all people and even all creation. Jesus, Paul writes, those things, and Paul writes, contemplate this, that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. This is where we know we're being asked to contemplate on a mystical level, because how is something, anything, the image of something invisible? Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. As Trinitarian Christians, we believe that we know God best by knowing Jesus Christ, Christ's mercy and goodness, Christ's wisdom and faithfulness, make all of God known to us. So as Paul writes here, in him, Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All of God in one man. All right, Paul writes, Christ holds all things together. In the short passage from Colossians that I read, the words all, all things, and everything occur eight times. Eight times. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So if we believe in Christ, we cannot think of the world and its inhabitants any of them, as discrete units all going about on their separate ways, we all, people and all things, find our being rooted in Christ, and Christ holds us all together. And finally, Paul says that if we believe in Christ, or that we that do believe in Christ are the church. At the point of nexus, where Christ holds all things together, he is our Lord because he is the head of the church, the body in which we find ourselves. He is the head of the body, the church. Okay? So, that's the list of what Paul says about Jesus. I mean, he may say some other things too. Those are things worthy, I think, of contemplating. Now, your contemplation may be taking you to some amazing places. For example, 
I'm going to show my math skills here. If Christ is the church, and Christ is also the image of the invisible God, then by the transitive property, the church is the image of the invisible God. And the church is you and me rooted together in Christ. It may be just another summer Sunday, hot outside, pastor on vacation, but even still today, we Christians are the body of the cosmic Christ, the church, the image of the invisible God, reborn and free from death, made new. All right, what you may also be contemplating is when is he gonna stop? So to move toward a conclusion, we find our purpose when we meditate on Christ, when we contemplate Christ, when we understand what the world is really like with Christ at its center, tying all things together and making all things new, we figure out at last where we fit. We discover as Christians in the pews at College Hill Presbyterian Church that the law and the order of the universe is not some list of propositions or some ineffable knowledge. We discover that all things are a person, Jesus Christ. When we know him, we are Christians. We are in tune even with what one person has called the grain of the universe. All things that have aligned themselves with that grain, who have been reconciled, who have been made whole, it is we who are Christians. That begins to be an answer to that earlier question that I asked, why are you a Christian? And what does it mean for our humanity that we are Christians? Well, it means that we live and move and have our being in the cosmic Christ, the firstborn of creation, the image of the invisible God, the Alpha and the Omega, the grain of the universe. It means that when we come to church and say we believe, we are putting ourselves in a story that is so much bigger than any other story. It is putting ourselves in the pattern and purpose of God's creation. It is putting ourselves as resurrected people, tied with all things to God and God's glory. It is putting ourselves in the story that is good news, that is eternal, that is gospel. And at the end of his exposition, Paul makes a move that I hope all of us can make. After weaving the poetry of the Lord Jesus, Paul simply states, I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. So why are you a Christian? Well, because I, insert your name here, became a servant of this gospel. Amen.
join me with the affirmation of faith for your name Bolton. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors to the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Here is the invitation to the offering. God loves a cheerful giver. We are invited to give to God's work in this place. Let us respond generously and with joy.
All right, I've got the chat open, and I, uh, I'm not going to use the microphone on the floor because that just seems like one further complication. Uh, but are there prayer requests or joys and concerns that you'd like to share? Yeah? Um, I have two. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we prayed for the riots in Hohofer. Brian Holhofer. Yes. Gracious God, we pray for the family of Ryan Holhofer as he has entered the church triumphant. We ask that you comfort them in their time of grief. They take comfort in you and in his memory. We also ask prayers for Anne's friend who has found out that she's very sick. She died, excuse me, I'm sorry. To... Oh. What's her name? Heather. And Lord, we with grief lift up Heather for those grieving her loss, for those missing her in these days. We ask that you send your spirit of comfort. God of mercy, hear that prayer. Others? For Ken, who's struggling to recover from a stroke. Gracious God, we lift up Ken. We ask that you give him the strength he needs to recover from the stroke, be with his caregivers and all those who are patiently waiting for his return to full health. Merciful God, in, in your mercy we pray. Hear our prayer. Others. When? Today? Today? Oh my gosh. Uh, did you hear that Chris and Emily are celebrating their 23rd wedding anniversary today? That's very good. <laughs> right. Holy God, we lift up Chris and Emily and their entire family as they celebrate their union of 23 years of matrimony. We ask that you bless them and continue to bind them together in love. In your mercy we pray, hear our prayer. Judy? For our country to find its way without violence and become whole. Yes. Holy God, we come to you this morning after the assassination attempt on President Trump. We ask that you have mercy on us as a nation, that you protect us from gun violence, that you help us make political decisions without violence, that you bind us together as a nation. And we ask especially that you inspire and awaken Christians to give a witness of peace. In your mercy. In the heat, yes. For those struggling in the heat. Holy God, in this time of summer when there can be time for leisure and celebration, we also attend to the intense heat that is plaguing many parts of the planet. And for those who don't have the resources to be sheltered from it, from the danger it poses, we ask that you shelter them and that you find ways, that you inspire us to find ways in our society to make the heat more tenable for all. In your mercy we pray. Oh yeah, check the phone. Let us continue in prayer. Almighty God, who taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere, hear us as we pray for others in the name of Jesus Christ. Inspire the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lead all nations in the way of justice and goodwill. 
Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold those in need and defend oppressed people, that this world may claim your rule and know true peace. Awaken all people to the danger we've inflicted upon the earth. Implant in each a reverence for all you have made, that we may preserve the delicate balance of creation for all coming generations. Give grace to all, proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy, that by their teaching and example they may reveal your love for all people. And this morning we pray a special prayer for our pastor, Matt Martis LaCroix, who is taking a well-deserved rest. We thank you for his blessing among us and his ministry, and we ask that this time of recreation will have given him new energy for service. Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all who are in trouble, sorrow, poverty, sickness, and grief, especially those known to us and those whom we name before you in silence. Heal them in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them by your grace, wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. And bring to our remembrance all those who, having served you on earth, now sing your praises eternally. May their endurance give us courage and their faithfulness give us hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
to love and serve the Lord, remembering that we are the body, the body of Christ, in the image of the invisible God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.